In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. As we are approaching the last few hours of the year, every one of us, every year we have what we call it yeah, the end of, end of the year resolution, or whatever you call it. But today I'm not going to share with you such message. Our title is Have a Hezekiah Eucharistic New Year. So we'll try to find out one of the great revivals in the Old Testament, and how it is related to the Eucharist, and how it could be a new beginning, a new start for all of us. Let me start with this verse from Isaiah chapter 32, verse 15, 16, and 18. Again, the Holy Spirit, as we spoke this morning in the liturgy, the Holy Spirit is always dominating and designing, planning, moving, motivating every one of us. Here is the prophecy, until the Spirit is poured upon us from on high. Yes, Isaiah was saying this 740 years before Christ because he was groaning and aiming to receive such a gift. But we have it. So how come we can read the prophecy but to see it fulfilled in my life and in your life? Until the Spirit is poured upon us from on high and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field. If you, are, you lived in the whole past year in a wilderness, he is telling you it's time to claim it to be a fruitful field. And the fruitful field is counted as a forest. There is no barren life anymore. Why? Because we are not waiting the Holy Spirit because we received the Holy Spirit in day one when we were baptized. Then justice will dwell in the wilderness and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. Then he's telling you, you can be one of my people. My people will dwell in a peaceful habitation, in secure dwellings, and in quiet resting places. If you never had this in the past year, tell him, I am here to claim it. To start a new year, a Hezekiah Eucharistic New Year. Before we start in the story, we are focusing only on two chapters. The second Chronicles chapter 29 and chapter 30. If you have your Bible, I encourage you all, whenever you attend any Bible study, please bring your Bibles. I know that you have it in your mobiles, your iPhones, but please, for your own sake, bring your Bibles and try to mark it and to find out where is the depths and the wells of the Word in your life. The story about Hezekiah, we go back to his father. His father, his name is Ahaz, was one of the worst kings in the history of the kingdom of Judah. He reigned for 16 years. Let me start with the ver first verse to see the privilege that we have. The opportunity to start a Hezekiah New Year. Here is 29, chapter 29, verse 1 and 2. Hezekiah became king when he was 20 years old, 25 years old, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Why I am putting this title, you have no excuse. As I told you, his father lived 16 years as a king, never worshipped the, God, the Lord a single day, and he was very, very far from God. So the last thing he has seen in his life was his grandfather, King Josem, when he was nine years old. Maybe you are coming this morning or this year saying, I am in this position because my life was a disaster. My parents were too far from God. My father was abusive. My mother was so and so. I have many excuses. And King Hezekiah has more than that. He saw the worship of idols in the temple designed by his father by all the priests and high priests in his time. But he's telling you and me, you have no excuse. Why? Because he started a new revival. We'll see in a moment that he started in the first day of the first month of the first year of his reign, while he was 25 years old. So at the beginning, the encouragement of the Holy Spirit is saying, you, you have no excuse, you can start now. It doesn't matter your past, your present, there's a new future if you, you choose to walk in this newness of life, claiming the year of Hezekiah, the Eucharistic New Year. So first of all, there's no excuse because I can start now. Yes, it's only a few hours to the end of this year, but you can start now. You can start today. 
But unfortunately, last year he was wanted to sometime else. And he's telling us no way to wait anymore. Second thing is, I will not waste a single day. If you want to, to receive this Hezekiah Eucharistic New Year, don't waste a single day. He says in the same chapter, 29, verse 3, In the first year of the reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. Then he brought in the priest and the Levites and gathered them in the east square and said to them, Hear me, Levites, now sanctify yourselves, sanctify the house of the Lord of God, of your fathers, and carry out the rubbish from the holy place. Yes, we'll read it in the next few verses. He started in the first day. In eight days, he was able to sanctify a big part of the temple. In 16 days, <coughs> the whole temple was pure from the rubbish that it had. So he's telling us how whatever the rubbish you have, it was rubbish for 16 years. Many different idols, many different sins. Whatever your sin is, whatever your idol was, whatever the time you spent with this idol, he's telling us now, we will never accept a single day to be missed out, not in the way of the Lord. So in the first year of his reign, in the first month, in the first day, he started the revival. He's offering the same offer to each one of us. Why? Because many times before we were thinking, I will do it. When? At one point. I will do it when these things happen in my life. I will do it if. He never said so. He has enough excuses to see that the priesthood was totally corrupted. The kinghood was totally corrupted. He reigned nearly in the year 715 to the year 680, which means after the uh, captivity of the kingdom of the north and after the split by 200 years nearly. So he's telling us, whatever the circumstances around you, in your church, in your community, you can have many excuses. To start later, but he's telling us, I will never waste a single day. And be sure that what he has done was a revival for the whole kingdom of Judah. Your revival will be not only affected you, we'll see it in a minute. Your revival, your repentance, your Eucharistic New Year will be different and it will change the world around you. So first of all, he's telling us, we have no excuse. Secondly, don't waste a single day. Verse 3, number 3, from verse 6 to 9, For our forefathers have trespassed and done evil in the eyes of the Lord our God. They have forsaken him. He's telling us the problem is disobedience. From day one, since the fall of Adam and Eve till the end, our issue is disobedience. I choose to follow my own understanding. I choose to make my own different gospel, which is, Another go totally different, not another gospel, as St. Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 1. They have turned their faces away from the dwelling place of the Lord and turned their backs on him. Therefore, the wrath of the Lord fell upon Judah and Jerusalem, and he has given them up to trouble, <coughs> to desolation, and to jeering, as you see with your own eyes. If you are coming and you see this in your life, Know that you can start. It's always a message of hope. He has seen all these things in his life day by day. He saw the evilness of his dad. And he saw the evilness of the priesthood. And he saw the worship of all other gods. But he said, from now on, I'm going to forsake him again. So Hezekiah, New Year, it says, no more sin in my life. No more disobedience in my life. Yes, but it seems it's hard. Why? Because I'm captivated in this sin or this bad habit or this bad circumstances for years. Yes, but he's saying in the first day of the first month of the first year, he had a decision. In a minute, he will tell us, I have decided to take a covenant. We can take a covenant in the New Testament. We renew a covenant we have taken in day one when we were baptized. We tell we told the devil, we renounce you, we renounce you, we renounce you. And when we renew the covenant, we say it again, we renounce you, we renounce you. And we accept Christ with his saving commandments. 
Firstly, he was saying, now it's time to make a covenant. Now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel that his fierce wrath may turn away from us. My sons not be neg neg negligent now, for the Lord has chosen you to stand before him to serve him. He was talking to the Levites and the priests at that time. And he's telling them, it's time to make a new covenant. Um, for, fortunately, not unfortunately, in the New Testament, we have one covenant. It has been done through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have been sealed with this covenant in day one when we, we were baptized and we received the gift of the Holy Spirit. But what happened? We forgot about the covenant. So for a new beginning in the new year, we need to renew the covenant, not to make a new covenant. Remember, in our Orthodox theology, we cannot make anything. He has done everything for us, and it's time to claim what we have. As we sang a few minutes ago, that every battle he won became what? It's my victory. I can't make a victory for myself. I can claim a victory he has done. I can claim a covenant he has done through the blood of the Lamb. So he is telling us, don't renew the covenant, but uh, renew the covenant. Don't make a new covenant because a new covenant has been done, sealed by the blood of Christ and sealed also by the Holy Spirit. Fifthly, he is telling us in verse 15, and they gathered their brethren and defied themselves and went according to the commandments of the king at the words of the Lord. Now they began to sanctify on the first day of the first month, on the eighth day of the month, they came to the vestibule of the Lord, so they sanctified the house of the Lord. So would you like to start the new Hezekiah Eucharistic year? Start from now. Start by full obedience. Start by putting your mind, your intelligence, your experience, your friendships, your circumstances aside. And now it's time to understand and to obey the words of the Lord. He was telling us, you went too far because you made your own gods. You went too far because you were relying on your own understanding. You went too far because you were relying on another king, not the true one. That's why the first verse we read today, he followed the ways of his father David. What does it mean? He followed an obedient king. That's why he became an obedient king. He made a stop, a change, a conversion in the life of the whole nation. Exactly what St. Paul says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 21. He was explaining how all the Israelites missed out the way of God. They have the commandments and they broke it. And even those who were called righteous or good people, they were not able to fulfill the law. Then he spoke about the other nations. They made their own laws and they broke their own laws. So what we can do? 321 Romans. But now. He is telling us you can draw this line and to say but now. Um, but from now. The righteousness of God has been revealed without the law. Testified by the law and the prophets. He, he is telling you you can start your new year. If the Jubilee year in the Old Testament was a year where blessing and restoration is there. When the Lord was introduced to the synagogue in Luke chapter 4, they pushed to him the uh, book of Isaiah. He read from 61, and he said, Accept the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he folded the, the manuscript and said, Today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. What does it mean? Today is not the beginning of the Jubilee year. He said, Because I am here, the new covenant that I'm going to, do, to make with you, every single moment, you could determine to be a beginning of a new jubilee year in your life. So the obedience of the children of God was based on this has been fulfilled in your hearing today. So obey the words of the Lord. Start your sanctification from now. Not tomorrow, not in the beginning of the year. It's from now. Then he was telling them, Praise him. Why? Once, sometimes we feel that we have to praise the Lord for us, to share a song or two at the beginning of the end, just to formulate the meeting, no? Because we repented. Always, as we said before, maybe, 
that every revival in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, at all times, it starts with a call of repentance, word of God, life of repentance, it ends up with Passover or Eucharist in the New Testament. This is my small cycle during the week. I receive a call of repentance. The whole week is a time of obeying the word, reading the word, studying the word, and I repent and confess. I have the Eucharist on Sunday or whatever day you choose. So he was telling them, now sanctification has been done. In 16 days, in the first month of the first year of his reign, the whole sanctification has been done. The word 16 here will have an effect in a few minutes. So he's telling them, so all the assembly worshipped, the singer sang, and the trumpet sounded. All this continued until the burnt offering was finished. And when they had finished offering, the king and all who were present with him bowed and worshipped, everyone. If you see the life of Ahaz and many other kings, they were worshipping the king. But the true king brought all the congregation to worship the one true God. Moreover, King Hezekiah and the leaders commanded the Levites to sing praise to the Lord with the words of David and Asaph the seer. So they sang praises with gladness and they bowed their heads and worship. In the end of the meeting, we are going to worship. But is it out of receiving a call of repentance, out of choosing to be obedient, or just we have to conclude the service with a song, whatever the song is? Tomorrow we have a night of praise, we'll praise, praise of Kiyak, and then English and Arabic songs, and then we'll have a talk, not to fill a time, not to make a program, but because we are joyful that we lived a life of repentance. Joyful that we are reading the word and obedient to the word. Then he was telling us, it's heart raising before fundraising. Always every church, every ministry, everywhere, struggling to raise money. He was telling them here, it's totally the opposite. Don't struggle to raise money. Then Hezekiah answered and said, now that you have consecrated yourself to the Lord, this is the beginning, you have consecrated yourself to the Lord, then all your money belongs to the Lord. Come near and bring sacrifices and thanks offerings into the house of the Lord. So the assembly brought in sacrifices and thank offerings, and as many as were of a willing heart brought burning offerings. He is telling us, if you are able to raise up your heart to the Lord, fundraising will not be an issue. It's not something that you have to announce it many times. Why? Because I believed my life and my money and my belonging be all of them consecrated to the Lord. So he's telling us it's time to know if my heart is consecrated, the normal consequence is to give. It's not just to seek the commandments. Yes, obedience to the commandments I have to give. But now it's a natural consequence of being consecrated to the Lord. So you will see the same thing in chapter 30. They did it once more. After this, I the Passover. He said everyone was offering as many as they can. Not tithing anymore. Why? Because they felt what we received is, you know, cannot compare it with anything else in our life. Then, what is the issue of Passover? Why every single revival in the Old Testament as we said, every single revival in the New Testament is related to the Passover, which is the Eucharist in the New Testament. A few things we have to note about the Eucharist before thinking of this Passover. The Passover in the Old Testament, if you remember, we read most of the readings of the book of Exodus on the Good Friday. Why? To say something very important. That the Passover at that time was not related to sin. Was, was related to life. What does it mean? The Lord didn't tell Moses, go and tell people, repent. Let's say, did you hear it at all in the, in the, in the, in, 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 at the time of Moses? The people at the time was very naive. They didn't worship the Lord for 430 years. It was about life. Every single family who killed the Passover lamb on that night, their firstborn was saved. It's about death and life. It's about 
celebrating the freedom. All of them were able to get out of the land of slavery. So in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, when any king is celebrating the Passover, he is telling us, now we have repented. We have read the scriptures. We are in obedience to the word of God. It's time to enjoy our freedom. It's time to enjoy and to see the beauty of the new life that Christ is offering to us. So he was calling for a Passover, but this Passover was very special again. Why? It says in the same chapter, chapter 30, since the time of Solomon, they never celebrated such a Passover, over 200 years. This is one thing. The other thing is, again, Solomon died in the year 930. Now we are in the year 715, yani nearly 215 years. He is calling the two nations. After the split of 200 years, he is calling the north and the south to celebrate the same Passover. There is no way to make unity away from the real Passover, the Eucharist. And it's a blasphemy when we have the Passover and we are hate each other. We are speaking badly about each, each other. We are dividing ourselves, divided families, divided community. It's a blasphemy, believe it or not. That's why he's saying in chapter 30, verse 1 to 3, And Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and also wrote letters to Ephraim and Manasseh in the other north. Israel is the kingdom of the north. Judah is the kingdom of the south. That they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, to keep the Passover to the Lord God of Israel. For the king and his leaders and all the assembly in Jerusalem had agreed to keep the Passover in the second month. What does it mean in second month? He reigned in the first month. The Lord commanded them in the book of Exodus to celebrate the Passover the 15th day of the first month. A few minutes ago, I told you, they finished sanctification on the 16th day. So they couldn't celebrate the Passover in the first month. That's why God gives them the allowance to celebrate it in the second month if they cannot do it in the first month. So he was telling here, for they could not keep it at the regular time, which is the 15th month, day of the first month, because a sufficient number of priests had not consecrated themselves, nor had the people gathered together at Jerusalem. So because of the sanctification process, it was delayed. But again, it's according to the word of God. We can make it on the second month. But here he was saying, nor had the people gathered together at Jerusalem. What does it mean? The Lord commanded them in the Old Testament that three times all male should appear before the Lord in Jerusalem in the Feast of Passover, which is this feast, and the Feast of Tabernacle, and the Feast of Pentecost. So he's telling you, I mean, sometimes you see that if I don't go to church today, I will go tomorrow. If I will not attend the liturgy this week, I can attend it any time during the week. He's saying the Passover was related that all people has to appear before the Lord. It's not about missing a liturgy or adding a liturgy. It's my belief that I am part of a body. And this body always, whenever the body is assembled, I should be there. So he's telling them because not consecrated themselves, the priests, nor had the people gathered together at Jerusalem. Every single time the church is calling for a liturgy, for a Passover, a fulfilled Passover, everyone is required to come by his own to see that I am part, a participant member of this Eucharist. So the call was different in this time. The Passover was different. That's why the whole year or the whole life of King Hezekiah was Eucharistic New Year. Why? Because we started with the Passover. In verse 9, he's telling you and me, your repentance is very effective. It's very effective in the life of many. Those who live here, around you, those who live there. And also your rebellion, your disobedience is effective. Choose whatever you want. Hear what he is saying. As I said a few minutes ago, now the Israelites, the kingdom of the north, were taken into captivity in Assyria 15 years before this event. So, for if you return, he is talking to those people in the north who never worshipped the Lord since the days of Solomon. 
What does it mean for us to celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem? We have our own idols in the north, in Samaria and Beit El. He's telling them, you, if you want to repent, if you are cooperating with the grace of God, you are going to change something in the life of your relative who are in captivity. For if you return to the Lord, he's talking to those who never worship the Lord, your brethren and your children, those who are in Assyria, will be treated with compassion by those who lead them captive, so that they may come back to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn his face from you if you return to him. Again, whatever your original nationality, Egyptian or Sudanese or Ethiopian or Eritrean or Iraqi, Palestinian, whatever it is, do you believe that your repentance here will affect them there? We know that everyone nowadays in the Middle East is suffering. Everyone is oppressed. Do you believe that your personal repentance will affect them? This is the truth of the Word of God. But you are taking it very lightly because I don't care. I don't think I'm so effective that I can affect people uh, so far from me. But here is the beauty of Hezekiah Eucharistic New Year. Some of them were mocking at him, what are you saying? We are living here a life different from them. If you read it in the whole chapter, uh, chapter 30, they were mocking at him. What are you saying? And maybe you are still mocking that your repentance will affect someone else. And your disobedience and unrepented heart is affecting your small family, your small congregation, and the whole world. Remember in Joshua chapter 6, the story of Ahan, son of Carmi, how his sin affected the whole nation. Despite he had a very powerful victory over Jericho, miraculously by the hand of God, he was defeated by a very small village called Ai. Why? Because a sin of one man. He's not telling you you are bad because you are sinning, but he's telling you you are so precious that your repentance will affect the whole world and your sin, unfortunately, also affecting everyone around you. So it's a choice to have a Hezekiah Eucharistic New Year to say that I adore my own personal repentance. I adore what the Holy Spirit is convicting me to stop doing it today. Why? Because I don't want to continue in this miserable life, the life of Ahaz. It's time to convert it into the Hezekiah Eucharistic New Year. Finally, your voice and prayer will come up to heaven. This is the last verse of chapter 30. So there was great joy in Jerusalem. They offered the sacrifice and they offered the Passover lamb. For since the time of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, there had been nothing like this in Jerusalem. Then the priests, the Levites, arose and blessed the people, and their voice was heard. And their prayers came up to his holy dwelling place to heaven. Are you willing? Do you wish that your prayers will be in the dwelling place to heaven. Yes, it's the journey. Take the whole journey with Hezekiah to start or to have Hezekiah Eucharistic New Year. Again, it's a start with no end. It's not a topic that we hit at the end of the year or beginning of the year. It's a life process. All my life, as you said, the church has many cycles. Daily cycle, weekly cycle, monthly cycle, and yearly cycle. Make your cycle always call of repentance, word of God and obedience, real repentance, pass over or Eucharist. If your life is shaped around the cycle of the church, your enjoyment will be totally different. And then be sure that then their voice was heard and their prayer came up to his holy dwelling place to heaven. If you are assured of the journey, be assured of the final destination of a prayer. It's in the dwelling places. It's in heaven. The Lord is encouraging us to start the new year. And I'm not saying it's new. It's a new today. To start a new life having Hezekiah Eucharistic New Year. May the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you from now and forever and ever.